YouTube to there. So you can actually see all the, um, all the, all the notes come up as we go along. And the, at the end of it, I've got the, this, this at the end runs at the very end of it, so you can actually see it then. So, but it is there. Um, we'll start with a word of prayer then. Father, may the word of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today, we're getting on to Pentecost. This is one of what I call the nodes in the Bible. You know what a node is? It's, it's a point of intersection. And at Pentecost, you have loads of different biblical subjects, theological subjects, all combining at one point. And so I had a choice of what to do and what one to take. And, well, basically I've got to do this in two sections. So it's this week and then there'll be next week. And even then I probably still won't cover everything that's in, in the book. I'd like to start off, though, in the book of John. So if you'd like to go to your first reading, which is uh, John chapter 20. This is Jesus at the Last Supper. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, this is Jesus after the resurrection. Correction. Jesus after the resurrection. When he first comes in on that first Sunday after the resurrection and he comes in and he finds the 11 disciples or sorry, 10 of the disciples there at that time um, I'll actually start at verse 21 so it's John chapter 20 verse 21 to 22 Jesus therefore said to them again peace be with you as the father has sent me so I send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them Receive the Holy Spirit. Does that say, receive it in 50 days time? So do you think when Jesus breathed on them, they received the Holy Spirit when he breathed on them and said, receive it? Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't officially come for another 50 days. Now, the word that they use here, this word breathed, is only used once in the entire New Testament. It's a particular Greek word. Uh, the Greek word emphasazo, if I pronounce it completely wrong, emphasazo, only once here. Now, when the Jews um, translated the Old Testament into Greek, they also use that word once in the entire Old Testament. If you go to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. And verse 7. And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And that is the only time in the Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that that word is ever used. So it is used twice in the Bible. Once when God breathed into man to create him, and once when Jesus breathed into the disciples. Is that that same word, Ruach? So, uh, no, that's not Ruach. Oh, that's a different one. We'll come to that. A one. This is a different one. Oh. So, so it is twice in the whole Bible, there, and at when Jesus breathed at his disciples. And that is the breath of life. In fact, in the, the Genesis, it's actually in the plural, so it's the breath of lives. So when God breathed into this lump of clay on the floor, he breathed the breath of lives into them. So here's Jesus at the resurrection, during the Passover, breathing the breath of lives into his disciples. Was the thief on the cross baptised in the Holy Spirit? No, not at all. He also wasn't baptised normally. He didn't do um, any Bible studies. He didn't have to do a confirmation course. He didn't do any of the church membership stuff or anything like that. Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. End of story. There are some Christian denominations that believe that 
in order to be saved, you have to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. You have to speak in tongues. You have to show some sort of manifestation of the Spirit. If you do not, you are not saved. That is not true. We are filled with the Spirit. When Jesus breathes on us, that Spirit is in us. It does not mean you have to speak in tongues. It does not mean you have to prophesy. It doesn't mean you have to do any of those things, which some people do believe. I've actually stood outside a tent meeting. My friend, um, we were collecting a caravan at the time, and I drove down with him to collect this caravan from this Christian tent meeting. And I heard the loudspeakers inside, and they had some poor person standing up on the stage. You believe that you've got to speak in tongues, don't you? Yes. If you don't, why aren't you speaking in tongues? What's wrong with you? And they were literally haranguing this poor person to make him speak in tongues. I've been to other places where, anyway, I, I, it's, not, it's not right to talk about other churches too much, but this is where you are saved. The Passover, the Feast of Passover, is the barley harvest in Israel. That's the, the biggest harvest that comes in. If they have a good harvest, that is life to the Jews. That means they have enough to live. Jesus breathed on them at the Feast of Passover. That's life. So when you become a Christian, Jesus breathes on you. Doesn't matter about the rest, that's life. When we come to Passover, 50 days later, that's the beginning of the, the wheat harvest, as we'll see later on. That to the Jews was abundant life. That was more. That was when the wheat come in, that's when the soft fruit started to be harvested, that's when all the, the figs and things like that. So the first harvest gave you life, the second harvest gave you abundant life. So we've got a, an idea here. If we go to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Someone want to read this one for me please? Romans chapter 8 and it's verse 6 to 9. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, is the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Now that's very specific. If the Spirit of God is not in you, you are not a Christian. That's very specific. And that's why some people say you have to speak in tongues, otherwise it doesn't prove you have the the spirit of life in them. But, as I said, Jesus breathed on them. He breathed life into them, life from the dead. So, the events around Pentecost are bringing us back from the dead. God is creating a new life in us. And taking it. So there is this principle going on in, in the events of Passover. The, uh, sorry, the event of Pentecost. But let's go to Acts now. Let's go to, um, in fact, let's go to Acts 1 to start with. And I want to look at the words of Jesus before he goes up to heaven. This is after he has breathed on them. After he has said, receive the Holy Spirit. So it's Acts 1 and it's 3 to 5. This is Jesus, literally at the point of ascension, giving instructions to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Uh, so verse 3. And to these also he presented himself alive after, after his sufferings by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking to them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Um, I ought to explain about the, the, the Pentecost, is exactly 50 days after the Sabbath, after Passover. So what happened on the day after, 
after Passover, or the, the Sabbath, the day after Sabbath, during the week of Passover, some rather important event happened. Dear idea, what have I been teaching you all these years? Oh, Sorry? Are you talking about counting the Omer? That is, yes. So, uh, a special event happened. So the day after Sabbath, yeah. in the morning, after the Sabbath day of Holy Week, what happens? The Sabbath being the Saturday. So what happens early on the Sunday morning of Holy Week? Jesus is raised from the dead. And that was the day that the, the, in the temple they offered um, the first sheaf of first fruit. So they had this big um, procession out to the fields, early, actually late at night. On Saturday after sunset they would then go out, because that would be their, their Sabbath, Sabbath was over, they would go out and they would choose a, a sheaf of wheat and they would bring it in, cut it down, they would thresh the wheat, they would grind it, they would make it pure, and sometime during that night they offered this wheat, they called it a wave offering I believe, and they waved it before God, and it was the first fruit of the harvest. And that was at the same time that Jesus rose from the dead. So in the temple, I've known that as they were lifting that harvest, lifting that sheaf up, that's when Jesus rose from the dead. And Pentecost is exactly 50 days after that. Later on we look at Leviticus, my favourite book, go to Leviticus, they, they count seven sevens, so seven weeks plus one, 50 days. So exactly 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, we come to pass, uh, Pentecost. This is 40 days later. God has a habit of putting things in order before he starts something new. So Jesus come back, first of all we had to basically debrief the disciples. This is what you got wrong, Peter and others. Let's get that sorted out. Okay, we've sorted that out. Now here's the instructions. And so Jesus ascends on the 40th day. There's another 10 days where the disciples have to sort out little things like replacing Judas and minor things like that and start getting their life in order. When they come in order, that's when the, the God um, arranges the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, I digress. Verse 4, sorry, of chapter 1 of Acts. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of me, for John baptised with water, but you shall be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But that was after he had breathed on them. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about salvation. It's about something else. Something more than salvation. Something abundance of salvation, if you like, abundance of life. Having made that sense, the word ruach, which Jean talked about, have you ever heard that word before? Um, Hebrew word ruach. Um, it's wind. It means in the, the Old Testament, wind. It's often used um, for when God does something, the Ruach, the wind comes. Uh, in fact, let's go to Acts 2. First two verses. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Remember that phrase, we're going to need that, all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, not a wind, but a noise, a noise like a violent rushing wind. The word wind there is the word ruach. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Everybody gets distracted when they get to Ezekiel with what angels look like. And wheels within wheels and people claim it's UFOs and things like that. Um, I missed the, the main points really of that, that one. So, the first chapter of Ezekiel. So, Ezekiel chapter 1, and it's verse 4. Here's Ezekiel, he's in exile in the land of Babylon, and he sees lots of various visions. Often, he, in a vision, he's taken back to Jerusalem as well. But this is where it all starts. And as I looked, behold, a stormy wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continuously and bright light around it and in the midst 
something that glow, like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. So that starts with the sound of a great wind. That, that would be, some of you have got the old, have anyone got the authorised? What's he got in authorised? Instead of a violent wind. Has he got something different there? Or great wind? Some of them say he's got a whirlwind. So quite often in the Old Testament it talks about a whirlwind. So remember when Elijah was caught up to heaven? It was in the whirlwind. In the, the violent rushing rock of God takes him up to heaven. Let's go to Genesis. Chapter 8. Verse 1 of chapter 8. This is after the flood. Or at the end of the flood, I should say. And God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were in the ark. And God caused a ruach to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. So this is the power of God to get rid of the ark. Remember the Moses in Egypt? There was a ruach come from the east. In the church today we were talking about the east wind. The east wind, the ruach, blew in the locusts into Egypt during the plagues. And then a west wind, the ruach, blew them out again at the end. It was an east wind, the Ruach, that divided the Red Sea. In fact, scientists have worked out that if the wind blows at a certain speed for a certain period of time, it will actually drive the water out of parts of the Red Sea. Because I saw that in, I think, the Times or something like that. It was in a proper paper, so it wasn't anything to do with the Christians. Um, but that's another matter. Go to Samuel, to Samuel. This is one of the Psalms of David that's not in... Not in the book of Psalms. So 2 Samuel 22 and verse 7 onwards. In my distress I called upon the Lord. Oh, you just yes, I cried to the Lord. And from his temple he heard me. And my cry for help came to his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the heaven were trembling. And they were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, and the fire from his mouth devoured. Colds were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens down and came, with thick darkness under his feet. He rode on the cherubim and flew, and he appeared on the wings of the Ruach. This is the power of God. So here you have the day of Pentecost, and you have the sound, it's not a real wind, it's the sound of a wind, coming from where? Heaven. It says it comes from heaven. You have the sound of wind coming from heaven, filling the house. This is the power, the <coughs> presence of God, filling the whole house. So that's why it's wind. But, but, but. Let's go back to Acts 2. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when they heard this sound occurring, the multitude came together. What was the sound? But you've all been told it was the sound of them hearing the voices, haven't you? You've all been told, oh, it's because they heard their own language. That's not why they came together. They heard Jerusalem heard the sound of the wind. They heard the sound of the presence of God. When they came to find out what it was, that's when they heard the disciples speaking in other languages. So here's the presence of God coming into the town. This might be the upper room. Our traditional thought of this is it's the upper room, don't we? We think of this is where it happened. Because a little while before, it talks about them going to an upper room, or the upper room, where they had the Last Supper and sorting out who was going to replace Judas. But it doesn't actually say that, it just says it's a house. Now it could be any house, it could even be the temple, the house of God. It may be that, because it says in another place that they spent their time continuously in the temple worshipping. This was the day of Passover, the uh, day of Pentecost. It may be they were in a corner of the temple and suddenly you had this mighty rushing sound and everybody rushed over to find out what it was. Because it doesn't say they rushed out into the streets. That's what we get in our mind, because we've seen so many films on it and so many sermons on it. But 
But wherever it was, it was the sound of the presence of God, the sound of the power of God that brought people together. But it wasn't that sound that brought salvation. Let's go to Kings. Another place where there's a mighty rushing voice, a not a sound. Remember poor Elijah? So we're in King, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. Can you remember poor Elijah in the, uh, in the cave? You've got a picture of him there. Would somebody else like to read this one for me? 1 Kings 19 and it's 11 to 12. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Mm. Or a gentle blowing. <coughs> it's a gentle wind. Uh -huh. Now to understand that particular thing, you, you've got three big powerful events. You've got mighty winds, you've got earthquakes, you've got fire. And God says, okay, first of all, you're going to replace, <coughs> the king of Israel is going to be replaced. There's going to be a big upheaval, he's going to be replaced. Then the king of Syria is going to be replaced. There's going to be a big upheaval. Oh, then Elijah, you're going to be replaced by Elisha. Oh, there's going to be a big upheaval. And that's the wind, the fire, and the, the, the earthquake. But God was in the still small voice. And what's that? And God goes on to explain, there are 700 prophets, or 7,000 prophets, still alive that you don't know about. They're going to come out of hiding. And I'm going to speak through them. What happens at Pentecost? There's 12 disciples in hiding. And they come out. How are 3,000 people saved that day? Is it by the sound of rushing wind? Is it by fire? Or is it by the word of God? That still, small voice. The word of God through his prophets, through his apostles, through his disciples. So here you have that mighty wind. And God is in the wind. God is the power of the wind, but he's not using that to force people to believe. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to, to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. Or the foolishness of preaching. So it's not the power of the Spirit forcing people, but it is the Spirit working through those people, and it's the breath of the disciples coming out that brings the Word of God and brings life to other people. So the breath of God is coming through the disciples in the same way God breathed into that clay. In the same way that Jesus breathed on his disciples, the breath of the message is what saves. It's not the, uh, all the various things we do, not the spiritual things we do in there, all our traditions, all our um, various things. It's the word of God spoken through his disciples, spoken through me, spoken through you, that will save. God will do some mighty things to get people's attention, but in the end, it's our word through us, through, through us to them. The next question down. Why did the Spirit not come unto the disciples in the form of a dove? Can you remember Jesus' baptism? It was a dove. So why did, when it came to the disciples, why didn't doves come down and land on? Let's go. No, it's always it's fire. Yeah. Now it's always worth looking up other passages in Scripture to find out why these things, rather than coming up with a silly idea ourselves. Look up other passages. There is one passage that talks about the tongue and fire. So let's go to James. Let's go to James. 
James chapter 3. If you want a straightforward preacher, you go to James. I wonder if James turned up at the Church of England Synod, what he would have to say on the subject. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Too late, sorry boss. <laughs> Knowing that such, um, such as we incur a stricter judgment. There's always a case those who know more get judged more. For we all stumble in many ways. If anybody does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body as well. Now, if we put a bit into a horse's mouth so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Behold, the ship, although um, also, though they are so great, they are driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. That's probably from a man who hadn't been out in a ship in a storm, but anyway. <laughs> so also the tongue is a small part of the body. Yes, it boasts great things. Behold, how great a forest fire is set, a flame is set by a small fire. The tongue is a fire, the very word of iniquity. The tongue is set amongst the members as that which defiles the entire body and sets it on fire for the... Um, the course of our lives and is set on fire by hell. Mm. Mm. Tongues of fire. Yeah. Tongues of fire. Um, couldn't we have a dove, Lord? I'm not so convinced about this tongues business. <coughs> Go to Ezekiel again. Actually, we can, we can skip Ezekiel. That vision that Ezekiel had of that whirlwind coming to, towards him with the flames and everything in the middle and the fire. As it comes closer, he, he sees angels around it and sees things like that. But basically he realised what it is, it's a portable altar. It's a wheeled altar. And in the middle is the, the altar of God and the Shekinah glory is in there. In fact, he looks above it and there is the, the, the crystal sea that we see in Revelations. It's like a window looking up into heaven and he looks through that window and he sees God in heaven. And so that is the the altar that is before the temple, before the presence of God. The holiness, the purity, the Shekinah glory, the presence of God. And so, there's fire, the presence of God. Now let's go to uh, Isaiah. This is why it's a tongue of fire that comes. Isaiah, chapter 6. Someone wants to read this one for me. So it's Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 8. In the year of that king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. <clears throat> then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. On the next one, please. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. That's an important word in Hebrew, it's hineni. Here am I, send me. And so many of the, the, the prophets had to say they had to agree to go with God. But here's Isaiah. He's already done six chapters, or five chapters of pretty big prophets, if you read them. I wouldn't mind doing any of them prophecies. And here he comes, he suddenly sees the presence of God. And he's not an evil man. But he says, I, I have unclean lips. I live in a people of unclean lips. And God takes the Shekinah glory from off the altar and touches his lips. Mm -hmm. 
That's why it's tongues of flame. It's fire. Jesus had a dove because he was perfect. He was a man of clean lips. The Holy Spirit could come down with the, the disciples, the apostles. The first thing God had to do was take the Shekinah glory and touch them. And yes, they were still men of unclean lips. They were still sinners. But his voice, his Shekinah, his purity was in them. And he could then use them. Hineni is an important word in the Bible. Um, a lot of the people in the Bible use it. Moses, for instance, said, Hineni, here am I, said Aaron. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of us go that way. <laughs> but a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the prophets use that word, Hineni. It is important. And it's important to Christianity. It's a beautiful word. Mm. Here am I, send me. I don't want to do it, but I'm here. If you're with me, if your spirit's in me, I'll do it. The James is what we were talking about in there today. Are you willing to stand with God? You might not want to be in a battle. We might not want to fight. You might not want to stand up to what's going on in the world and take what they chuck at us. But as he was talking, I was thinking, you know, the idea of you having your back to the wall when people were sword fighting and things, you didn't want the enemy behind you. So sometimes you had to stand with your back to a wall so no one can get behind you. If that wall happens to be the wall of the temple and the Holy of Holies is on the other side, that's a God wall. good wall to stand against. When you're standing with God at your back, yes. he's the one behind you. Yes. That's what this is about. All of these disciples, apart from John, were in some way martyred. All of them, in horrible yeah. ways. Yeah. Isaiah, the, the legend is that he was put in a hollow tree trunk and cut in half. If you look at what Jeremiah went through, he was thrown into a well, he was imprisoned, he was beaten. Virtually all the prophets were killed. <clears throat> but they were standing with God at their back. And death isn't the end. Isn't that incredible? People always say, oh, we've got her back. You know, mm. there's a saying that's common, isn't it? Yeah. You've got your back. Got Imagine God having back. God that's having your back. back. Yeah. So even if you lose the battle, you win the war. Mm. Let's turn sides. Over to the next side. Back to Acts. Uh, 4 to 11, it's chapter 2, 4 to 11. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <coughs> now they were living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because every one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. The, the word language there is the word dialect. Nowhere in the book of Acts does it say anything about unknown tongues. Um, if any of you have been to a Pentecostal church or know about speaking in tongues, they often speak in an unknown tongue which sounds to everybody else like gibberish. That comes in the book of Corinthi uh, Corinthians, yeah. They talk about that. But in every incidence in the book of Acts, it is a known language that is known to somebody. Now the question is why? Why could all these people could speak Hebrew? Because they had come from all over the, the world, they were Jews, and they understood Hebrew. So why didn't the disciples just speak to them in Hebrew? Why did they have to speak to them in uh, Latin or Greek or the other countries in here? Let's, let's read them. They were amazed and they marveled and said, why are they... Uh, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans, who weren't very bright by the way, now each one of us hears in his own language, his own dialect to which he was born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, um, 
Pergila and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from both Rome, both Jew, Greeks and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongue speaking the mighty deeds of God. But God could have just done it in Hebrew. The reason is, you see the picture there next to it? What's that picture of? Famous, famous painting. Tower of Babel. What happened at the Tower of Babel? Yeah. You have a whole group of people, and it's interesting. Um, let's go to Genesis 9. Genesis 9, verse 1. This is after the flood. This is what God said to, well, humanity at the time, the whole of humanity, through Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Now to fill the earth, do you stay in one place? <coughs> you spread out. Let's go over a couple of pages to 11, chapter 11 of Genesis. Now the whole earth used the same language and spoke the same words. And it came about they were journeying in the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one to another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used the bricks for stones, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city, and a tower whose top will reach to heavens. That let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Can you see what they were doing there? That's rebellion. God had given them instruction, and they were rebelling. Mm. Now the idea of making a, a, a mountain, that's what the Tower of Babel, a mountain up to heaven. They're trying to get to heaven, but what they're doing is they're doing it by rebellion. And also, there's mud bricks. What's humanity made out of? Mud. Yes. <laughs> so we have mud bricks human effort, if you like, trying to get up to heaven. But doing it in rebellion against God. And of course the irony is they don't know that God is walking in their midst. He says God goes down and takes a look and he's listen. So they don't even know that God's not up there, he's down here. And they're in rebellion. They have all things in common. They have language in common. They're all together in one place. But they're in rebellion. And so what does God do? Splits the language. Now in Pentecost, we have all these disciples in one place, having all things in common. But now it's different. It's in obedience. And so God undoes that curse. And the, the message now goes to every language. Down below, another picture. Mount Sinai. <coughs> Let's go to Exodus 19. Another mountain. We're doing a mountain ser sermon, uh, series of sermons at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I've got two mountains here so far. We've got the mountain of Babel, which is an artificial mountain. We've now got the mountain of Sinai. Would someone like to read this one for me? Uh, 16, verse 16 to 20. So it came down on the third day when it was morning, but there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Perfect. Thank you. Here we've got a loud sound again, haven't we? We've got fire again, haven't we? We've got God descending again, haven't we? Yet where are the people? They're stuck at the bottom. Yes. They can't come up to God. 
because you've got the holiness of God. And they have to have a mediator. Someone who takes the holiness of God and brings it down to man. That's why later on they t um, Moses said there will be a prophet like me. The prophet, they described mm -hmm. it. Someone who is a mediator between God and man. Yeah. There's a whole load of theological stuff that comes into Pentecost mm -hmm. from every angle. So here's another mountain. But the law, there's a division between God and man. If you just go by a set of instructions, I need to follow this set of instructions, you can't do it. There's a division between God and man. That division has to be broken. And so in Pentecost, we have, once again, God coming down in fire, in noise, his presence. But this time, it's in the heart. And so rather than the law being too high, you can't reach it, you can't attain it. It's written in tablets of stone, but you can't do it. Now the law is written in the human heart. So these three, we talked today about Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Because the Jerusalem, the, the original mountain it was built on is Mount Zion. That's where the temple was built. That's where the Holy Spirit fell, on Mount Zion. You've got three mountains here. You've got an artificial mountain in a desert. You've got a mountain in, a, in a, another desert, which is too high for people to reach. And now you've got the mountain where God comes and lives in amongst his people. All these three are infinitely connected. In fact, the, the Feast of Pentecost, to the rabbis, they said it was the celebration of the giving of the law. And so that day they would celebrate the giving of the law. And on that day, God chooses to put his spirit in them. The giving of the... Jesus said that those who love me will keep my words. And you can only do that if the spirit of the Holy Spirit is in your life. So this is the celebration of the giving of the spirit. The giving of the law of God into our hearts. Let's go to Leviticus now. Let's go to Leviticus. Probably where I should have started really. This is the instructions how Pentecost works. Leviticus 23. You know you're in a good time when you go to Leviticus. <laughs> Leviticus 23 is basically the layout of all the, the seven feasts, the seven Jewish um, feasts in the Bible. And we're going to 15 to 17. I'll read this one. You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, that's the day that Jesus rose, from the day when you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. And you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. <clears throat> then you shall present a new grain offering to the Lord. And you shall bring it from your dwelling places. Anybody got a different word there? Dwelling places. From wherever you live. From, wherever you live. <clears throat> from your dwelling places, two loaves of bread for a wave offering another wave offering, made of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour, baked with yeast. yeast, or leaven, as a first fruit to the Lord. Those of you can remember back to when I was doing Jesus and the Passover, what's special about leaven? Spiritually speaking, what does leaven represent? Sin. 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 It's the only offering with us. Yeah. So here you have something that is spiritually or sinful being offered to God. <coughs> and you bring it from wherever you're living, from your home. The word literally, I don't know if I've got the word written down there, the literal word means from your sitting place, from where you sit. Now that had more significance than we'd have. You are sitting in a chair, that's your sitting place now. But have you ever heard the expression of seat of power? So for instance, the, the king, his proper seat, if you like, his throne, is in Westminster Abbey. His administrating seat is in Buckingham Palace. And he's got various other seats, so he doesn't actually live in Buckingham Palace, he just uses his glorified office now. The, the seat of power for this country is in Westminster. 
or if you believe it's conspiracy theorists in some, some backroom Illuminati. <coughs> or the seat of authority of America is allegedly in the White House. Or the seat of authority... You've got this idea of a seat. And it's in the Bible as well. If we go to Kings, let's go to Kings, 1 Kings, chapter 10. A quick glance at the enemy, and it tells me I'm running over as usual. Remember the Queen of Sheba coming to see, um, forget the uh, Hollywood movie, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, so, 1 Kings chapter 10. This is the Queen of Sheba coming to see um, Solomon, to see his, his wisdom. Uh, so it's 1 Kings 10, it's 1 to 9. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. So she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke to him of all that was in her heart, and Solomon answered her with questions. Nothing was hidden um, from, from the king, which he did not explain to her. Then the queen of Sheba perceived the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he'd built, and the food on his table, and the seating of his servants. Have you got that word there? <laughs> seating of the officials. Yeah. The attendants and his, uh, the waiters and their attire and their cupbearers and, the, uh, and, and his stairways by which he went up to the house of the Lord and there was no more spirit in her. The seating of his officials. So it's not merely somewhere you sit. It's not merely somewhere you live. It's also, I mean, the seating of the officials, it's the government. It's, it's everything. It's where it's your dwelling place. It's how you live. It's, it's the whole lot. It's far more an important word than just a chair to sit down on. And here's God saying, bring from where you are sitting these offerings and offer them to me. In the same way that the, the first wave offering, the same way if you like Jesus was offered, come and bring them to me from your home places, from where you dwell, from where you work, and offer them to me. Yes, they are simple, but now they're acceptable. Let's go to Exodus again, 25. You all seen the film Rangers of the Lost Ark? The Ark actually consists of two pieces. It's not one whole thing, it's two separate pieces, completely separate. The ark is just literally the box at the bottom. On top is something called the mercy seat. So the lid of it is a separate part, and it's a separate in the eyes of God as well. Um, so if we go to uh, chapter 25, verse 16. This is the making of the ark. And you shall put into the ark the testimonies which I shall give you, and you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits white. And you shall make two cherubims of gold uh, from hammered work at one end, of one end, at the end, sorry, at the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherubim at one end and one cherubim at the other. And you shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat and, it, and its two ends. And the cherubim shall have their wings spread out, covering the mercy seat, with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be turned towards the mercy seat. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, in, um, top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimonies which I shall give you. And I shall meet you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony and I will speak to you all that I will give you in commandments for your sons of Israel. In heaven, if you look at Revelations, if you look at Ezekiel, you have the, the throne of God and then you have the real life cherubims around it. Here down on earth you have 
a mini version. You have the little cherubims and you have the mercy seat. This is where God sits. So when he's not in heaven, the, one of the advantages of being omnipresent is you can be in more than one place at once. So God can be in heaven, but he also can be between that. It's the mercy seat sitting there. Sitting. Sitting. Go to John. Last Supper, John chapter 14. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of Truth, who the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him, or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you, and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more. But you will behold me, because I live, you shall also live. In that day, you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what is this happening that you will, you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. Our seat. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all that I have said. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will come and abide will come and sit. Let's go back to Acts. Acts chapter 2. Anybody got the authorised version here? No? Okay. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there was from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing to themselves and they rested on each one of them. Anybody got a different word for rested? Settled. Settled. Literally the word is sit, sat. So they were sitting in a house and God came and sat on them. Or more accurately, sat in them. The mercy seat on top of the ark is where God came and talked to his people. The mercy seat is now in his disciples, in those who believe him, in those who have faith. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. All three. All three. That's what it said there. Yeah. We will come. We will come and live in them. <coughs> we never say that, do we? We always say yeah. the Holy Spirit in us, yeah. but it's the whole Trinity. Yeah. I mean, it's the Holy Spirit's job, as it were, but it's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will come and sit. We will dwell. We will have our seat of authority inside. It's making us feel more special. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm more alarmed, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible. At one stage, the Apostle Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of the living God? Your body is the temple of the living God. Maybe I'll to wash it a bit more. Uh, it's frightening, yes. It's, it's awesome, it's frightening. But God has taken his seat in us and he's speaking out through us to the world. In the same way as the Holy of Holies, God just came in there. But it's, this isn't the end, by the way. This isn't the end of it. This is, as, Christians, as Christians, we think we're the end all and be all of it, and everything's wonderful, and nothing will be greater than us, and Christianity is wonderful, and God's going to come down. This isn't the end. It goes on beyond this. 
There will be a time when Jesus comes down and takes his place on this earth as king. And then there will be a time, it's in Revelations, uh, the New Jerusalem. I'm skipping on a bit. Let's go to this, just read that bit, then come back to the others. Go to Revelation. Go to Revelation. As wonderful as Pentecost is, it's only a stepping stone to what God wants. Revelation chapter 20, 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is amongst men, and he shall dwell amongst them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be amongst them, and he shall wipe away every tear, and their eyes, and there shall be no longer any death, and there shall be no longer any mourning, or crying, or pain, for the first things have passed away. That's not now, that's the future. Pentecost is a stepping stone to what God wants. First of all, man was trying to build their way up to God. Then God came down, but man couldn't come near him. Now he's put his presence, his word, his spirit, his rock in us. He's working towards the day when he can live amongst us. This is only a stepping stone, but boy, is it a stepping stone. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is written to a church that has lots of problems with their, the way they understand the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and he's trying to explain to them what the Holy Spirit's about in some ways. And now, this is Paul writing, and now, he who established us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. A pledge. What's a pledge? Guarantees. Guarantees. A down payment. There used to be a word earnest. The old authorised would give us an earnest. It's a, it's a down payment. It's a promise of something better to come. What did Jesus promise his disciples at the beginning of the Last Supper? Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to where I am. That where I am, you may be also. That's the promise. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. One day you're coming to live with me, but for the time being, do you mind if I go into your spare room? I'm going to live in you. And one day, I'm going to take you to where I am and you're going to live with me and we will be together forever. So the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Spirit, is a promise. It's a pledge. It's a down payment. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. I can't remember why I wrote it down, but we'll go to that. We'll end up on that one. The problem is I see so many verses I think I should do and then I forget what I put them down for. 1 Thessalonians 4. Oh yes, I know. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to... Uh, yeah. But I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about these th those who have fallen asleep, that you may not grieve as the rest do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until his coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with him. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Okay, that was the one I was supposed to end on. The Holy Spirit is a pledge. The Holy Spirit is the fire from the altar that purifies our tongues, that purifies our lips. The Holy Spirit is the wind of power 
but it's the still small voice that God uses through us to bring life to others. Next week we'll go on to a further section with this, but I think we'll leave it there. I'll end with a word of prayer. Lord God, Lord, we are people of unclean lips and we live in a land of unclean lips. Father, may your spirit work through us, cleanse our words and bring life to those who hear them. Lord, make your dwelling place in our heart. Lord, and keep our backs, that one day we may be with you, no matter what the world does to us, Lord. Lord, may we keep our faces towards you and keep our, back, keep our backs as well, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your unspeakable, unknowable, wonderful gifts. And Lord, may we know your presence in our hearts. And may others get to hear the noise and get to hear the words. Amen and Amen. Thank you all. So I went over time again, as usual.